everyone, and we are back. Welcome to World Interaction Design Day. Um, thank you everyone that's been sticking around and popping in and out. We're several hours into our 24 hour live stream, starting in Sydney, and then moving to Munich in a couple of hours and then finishing off in San Francisco. Uh, we're so excited to be here on Behance um, to answer a couple of questions that have been coming up. Some people have been asking, are the videos gonna be available on replay? Yes, they are. Um, so feel free to jump in and out as you go through. Uh, you could literally fall asleep for eight hours, get up again, and then continue watching this live stream. So uh, we're having a great time. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Flynn, and this is my last session for a little while, so I'm very excited uh, to be <laughs> here with- be exhausted. Yes, <laughs> but I'm having um, high energy, so oh, much energy. Okay. Um, trust and responsibility just gets me out of bed. Um, I'm very excited for you to be here. Thanks, Flynn. Thank you. So I'm um, here with Prue Jones, um, Design and Creative Director at yes, Fjord. That's right, in Melbourne, yes. In Melbourne. Um, very excited that you could make it up here to Sydney. Thanks for having out, me. Hang out with us. Yeah. Um, and I thought maybe we could start with just a little bit about the day in the life of Ooh. Prue Jones. Okay. Um, yes, well, I find myself at this point in my career, I mean, a lot of the time I'm doing things like this. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not so much on the tools anymore, although I do love a good shot at a visual refresh or a brand, so mm -hmm. um, that's always fun. But yeah, a lot of um, just talking to people. Um, mm. That includes clients and people in our other studios around the world. Mm. Uh, yeah, one of the great things about my job is I get to talk to all sorts of designers in our other offices all over the world and get their yeah. viewpoints on things. That, that is a highlight, I have to say, for my current role. Mm. That's yeah. fantastic. And um, how has your career evolved over time, because we had Tara on, and Tara um, was quite was very corporate, and then yeah. did a lot of moves to make sure that she she ended up going in the direction that she wanted to go. Mm. Um, I know because of Behance and things like that, it's probably a lot of designers out mm. there. So mm. I'm always interested. Like, how did you get yeah. to where well, you I'll are? Well, I'll say I I um, actually I, wor I have worked with Tara, Tara before. Mm -hmm. Very uh, inspiring individual. She's I think we might know Tara thanks to you. Uh -huh. Actually, she is such an inspiring and knowledgeable mm. individual around design. She's amazing. Yes, so my background is actually quite different to hers. Um, I actually started out my career in advertising, which is probably right. a dirty word. Um, and I well, actually, I started as a designer and then naturally sort of went into art direction from there. So mm. in advertising, and then have just run the full gamut. I um, when, once I was in advertising, I actually became a writer. So I'm, for me, I'm really all about communication, mm. um, but more recently sort of really into the more technological side of things and mm. I'm really enjoying seeing that aspect of my career develop as well. Yeah, fantastic. We'd be obviously around a lot of that with, with Fjord. And mm. so I oh guess yeah, we're all about that. Yeah. yeah, and we're gonna find out a little bit about that right now. So just to remind everyone in the chat, if you do have questions throughout, feel free to ask them if we've got a good Got a good gap and it's on topic. We'll, we'll definitely ask those questions as we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say before I started hmm. that today um, I'm really not going to be talking about trust and responsibility on a micro level. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of talking with a wide lens. Um, so I'm going to talk more broadly about trust and the interface between a brand. Great. And just so you know, everybody out there, um, it's trust and responsibility is the theme yes. uh, for World Interaction Design yes. Day, which I probably should have said at the top of the show. <laughs> it's it's been a couple of episodes in a row, so yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and you're probably a little bit tired. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's about the trust at the interface between brands, oh. consumers, citizens, and governments, um, corporations, and individuals. Um, and this has real implications at the service design level, which is of course where Fjord does a lot of its work. Yeah. Um, Who's Fjord, you might be asking. We um, we were we actually have been acquired by Accenture. That happened in 2013 as their design and innovation practice. We've got over a thousand designers in 28 countries around the world. Wow. Then you can see them there. Um, that in the background, that photo is all of us gathered in Berlin for our annual Equinox conference, where we all get together and share intel about being designers and what's going on in all local markets. Um, wow. we, we find it all very exciting. We swap t-shirts, this is one of them. Just oh. a shout out to the Singapore office for my wow, t-shirt. Wow, shout out Singapore. Uh, yeah. That's hey, awesome. Janja and Ted, hello. Hmm. Um, but perhaps we're probably most well known for um, our trends report, which mm. comes out every year. And this is just about to drop again, actually at the end of the year. We've been working very hard on that. And I think that the reason why it's so widely anticipated is because of that global presence. We really do know design in the global sense. Um, yeah, so all of, all of our designers who work with gov government and corporations around the world, um, 
you know, we really have that knowledge that sort of encompasses a whole lot of um, industries and, and markets. So that's it's widely ante anticipated for that reason. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be diving into one of these trends uh, a little bit later on a, a cool. deeper level. But um, and these uh, trends are always available. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. These trends yeah. are always available publicly. Absolutely, which they I think are. Is, yes, is really fantastic because um, the, the, I've got the URL here. Will we put them in a um, yeah, we can put we them can, in. Yeah, yeah, we can put them in. As, if anyone wants to check them out in more detail. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, so that, and that's really um, one of our big things is trends. Uh, but just on a trust level, I mean, as part of Accenture, the way we work too is also very, um, I mean, there's a lot of, as you can understand, we don't operate in some countries, all that kind of stuff. So mm. we, are, but we have a very strict code of business ethics as well. And uh, obviously that's because trust is vital in business. Mm. Um, now, I just wanted to put this, this because um, I'm going to be talking a lot about trust, promises, broken promises, what happens. Um, but this quote by Santosh Kalwa, who is a, a Nepalese human-centred um, interface technologi technologist and poet. Wow. Um, yeah, I know it's kind of like a, a weird job description. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> trust starts with truth and ends with truth. Uh, so trust, yeah, it's really all based on truth. And, and, and this is really what I'm talking today, but I want to really dive into what does truth mean in mm. today's world. Um, I love the duality of, of this quote um, because it, things can be true until they're proven otherwise. So which modality is correct? Yeah. Um, this is really important. Anyone making promises, including brands, can so easily be caught out when they break their promises or are outright deceptive, as we've seen many examples mm. of that. So, okay, weird picture. That proof is essential to trust um, and people generally can trust when they can see something or experience it firsthand and it can really be in the smallest detail. And I guess that's what, you know, here talking about interactions. Mm. Um, this is why Visa spent a whole year creating a sound for customers to hear when a transaction goes through safely. Do you want to hear that sound? I would, I would love to hear that sound. You ready? Yeah. This is a year's worth of work. Okay. That's it. That's it. That's the that sound. That is the sound. Do you want to hear it again? We might as well. Two yeah. years. Bang. <laughs> there <No>. you go. <laughs> but without that trust signif uh, signifier, people would, in doubt the, would doubt the integrity of that transaction. And, and, and it is a really small thing, but mm. Visa knew that was vital to get right. And you know, mm. it's heard billions of, of times around the world every day. I do love that idea of, of spending it because you often hear as a designer, um, oh, I could have done that. You know, if, yeah. there's a, if there's a logo or something Absolutely. that seems quite straightforward, course, I could have yeah. done that. Oh my God, I can't believe it costs that much money sort of thing. And yeah. of course it's a brand that's been rolled out and exactly. all sorts of things evolved. But I do love the idea of, oh, that's a year just to get this. I know. But there's probably this big like, tons of research behind yep, you can getting to that and Absolutely. it's like here are the crosses where it's like brow, brow. okay One, that's where we don't want to be yep, yeah exactly yeah okay so segue back into this slide as mm. i was going to do mm. um speaking of integrity and in transactions um are you still on facebook nope deactivated no? okay yeah Personally. the whole delete facebook movement is about that breach of trust mm. i mean look if if facebook was a tinder date throwing up a whole lot of red flags, you'd be out of there <laughs> saying you're leaving to wash your hair, pretty much. Um, so what started out as a trusted, seemingly neutral platform to keep in touch with your friends and family has morphed into this entity that has acknowledged its suppo supposedly private user data was used against US voters by Cambridge Analytica. And that's what we've heard, we've heard about that so much over the last 12 months. Um, and of course, manipulated the outcome of the elections and even Mark Zuckerberg says he doesn't understand how the platform works right. anymore. So um, be hard to trust a product if you don't if the maker of that product doesn't understand it. But then there's advertising, right? Mm. And advertising is a great example of where trust has to be uh, created in order for consumers to uh, get on board with brands and buy products. And this year at Calm, there are so many examples of this. Uh, this is one of my favourite entries. Uh, it's a really good example of this type, type of trust in gen, in gen, engenderment. Answer that word. Mm. And there was Nike's um, Dream Crazy campaign. And if you don't know this famous face, this is Colin Kaepernick, famous for not taking a knee mm -hmm. during the national anthem pregame um, in a protest against Black Lives Matter. Um, 
there's a, um, that the case film of this is widely available online, but I'll just talk it through to you. So obviously this, this sparked an enormous uh, debate about the anthem itself and who it represented. It was um, seen as very divisive and un-American not to stand during the uh, national anthem. The president lost his mind over it and it was one of the biggest stories of, of the year. Uh, but in September, Nike harnessed that consumer sentiment for the 20 year anniversary of Just Do It and featured Colin Kaepernick in a campaign. Mm. And it, uh, that generated enormous trust in that brand. And they did this by really showing who they are and taking a stand. And in doing so, they made themselves really vulnerable. And if you've ever read any Brene Brown, who's like, I think she's got one of the most watched TED Talks ever at 4.3, uh, 40, sorry, 43.5 million views. Um, she talks about vulnerability and authenticity increasing trust, which is exactly what's sort of happened here. And that's because actions really do speak louder than words. Uh, we trust people, and in this case, we trust corporations when we see them doing the right mm. thing, when what they do is right, not convenient, or worse, you know, expedient. Um, and so when Nike said believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, they were really talking about themselves as much as they were talking about Copernic. Mm. Um, they knew that when they took a stand in this way that they may take a hit. And that's, yeah, that's kind of, uh, hopefully I'm not stepping on your, ne no. your next point, but yeah, that, that is what I remember very well from the campaign is, is people burning their Nikes. Right. Exactly. I so promise I wasn't screen, no. I promise I wasn't Stop screen taking. sniping. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I thought so. they were chickens. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm glad they're not. They're not. They're, they're just not. shoes. So that in sort of, um, yeah, and people re reacted really badly um, mm. because Nike essentially divided their fans into two camps, those who identified with Copernic and who, and then there were those who considered the, the flag and the anthem to be absolutely sacred. Mm. Um, and Nike was almost implying that those who didn't show solidar solidarity with Copernic stood for nothing right. or, or nothing good mm. anyway. Um, and, and, but yeah, as you said, people reacted in crazy ways, burning their shoes. And of course, uh, maybe no one more crazy, uh, weighed in and says, what was Nike thinking? Um, you know, there's that famous Oscar Wilde quote. Uh, he said that no publicity is bad publicity. Um, but you know, when Donald Trump's tweeting about your brand, you probably know you've hit a nerve. Um, and the sentiment did seem to agree for a while, like Nike stock just started trending down. And if I was an exec at Nike, I think I would have had so many sleepless nights mm. at this point, like the stock literally fell off a cliff uh, until celebrities started to shift that sort of uh, sentiment into positive territory. Um, and this is a really good indication of why brands still use uh, celebrity ambassadors or an endorsement because people actually trust um, people. Mm. Um, and you've got Kim, Jim Carrey here proudly showing off his new Nikes on nighttime TV. And then the people of colour um, obviously involved in this because it was about Black Lives Matter weighed in. Where you had Whoopi Goldberg and Spike Lee showing support. And they really were able to amplify that Black Lives uh, Matter message. And then everything just turned around. And mm. that's really due to the campaign, which was, you know, amazing. In the end, Nike sales increased by over 30%. Um, that's like a third of your company profit increase mm. from one campaign. Ca campaign. Um, and they, they really took that leap and, and hoped that their loyal fans wouldn't desert them. But they, in fact, gained new fans. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting yeah, proposition, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like you're weeding out the old bad yeah, ones really, and really. bringing in your, um, the fans you actually want. Um, yeah, so that... <laughs> I have a message. I actually have a question I think slots yeah. in really well for Joe. Um, how important do you think authenticity is to a brand and it's, the message? It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. If you, you know what it's like when you're interacting with somebody and you don't feel like they're being themselves, there's that mm. instant sort of mistrust created. Um, and people are definitely not stupid. Um, you really have to be authentic in everything you say and do. And of course, if you're talking in a brand sense, that means consistency. Um, in all of your communications mm. and in like in Nike's case standing up for the right things um, yeah amazing uh, this I just um, gobsmacked by the outcome of this like six million dollars worth of brand value created mm. and you know there I can't think of any campaign that's ever had a hundred and sixty three million dollar media spend um, and they they got all this media for free just because of the the controversy around it amazing now do you think that they knew that this would happen or do you think they did it anyway oh, i think they took a massive risk and and, yeah. and, it, and it looked like in the middle of the campaign that they had done and 
And like I said, those Nike, yeah. execs, Nike execs must have just been like, oh, God. What did we, we do not? the right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. they morally felt they did the right thing, but perhaps yeah. they thought, but financially with sh- shareholders and other people yeah. worked for this company yeah. and things, did we do from a business sense the right thing? But as it turned out, you know, financially and morally, yeah. presumably yeah. they're sleeping well now. <laughs> they certainly are. Mm. They, they certainly are. Um, yeah, in fact, all records were broken with this campaign. Um, and it's actually just won our Creative Arts Emmy, so that means that there can be more sort of uh, controversy or um, amplification of that Black Lives Matter message as well as a result. Mm. Uh, this campaign is not done. Um, the LA Times actually put it really well when they said, no, he just did it, which is a great spin on their just mm. do it thing. Um, they, and they just did the right thing regardless of how it was gonna play out. Unfortunately, on the other hand, Copernic did pay Right. Um, so he's not in danger of being destitute anytime soon because mm. he um, he is, is obviously living large off the royalties of, of this. Um, but n- but no one wants him on their team anymore. Right. It's a bit of a shame. Yeah. Um, that might be something to do with the fact that there isn't one black owner of all 32 NFL right. teams, NFL yeah. teams, NRL teams. Um, but apparently Jay Z sort of in line to purchase a a team so maybe that will change i hope so i hope so um (laughs) maybe we should look at this another way with another example um so what if believing in or um this admitting that something was wrong with your actual product means that you actually had to sacrifice it so in the face of overwhelming evidence that smoking does actually cause cancer, um, Philip Morris has finally fallen on its sword and is reorienting its entire business by asking the world's one billion smokers to do one thing, quit. Mm. Interesting. Um, yeah, they're now spending 90% of their R&D on low combustion products that don't cause cancer. And to make maintain that transparency, they keep all the science uh, from their research publicly available. You know, in years they used to say, oh, smoking doesn't cause cancer, and even though the research did pub- uh, mm. point to it. Um, but, you know, they don't really have a choice. Uh, they're actually willing to put themselves out of business to be seen as trustworthy. So important is this um, because they know that without trust, they have no new customers mm. and they're a dead business. Um, so the, the, the motives uh, for reinventing themselves might be questionable. And frankly, the jury is out on whether the tobacco companies will ever gain the, the trust of consumers given their past mm. behaviour. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, on the other hand, this gold winning lion, uh, gold lion winning campaign from IKEA in Israel, again seen at Cannes this year, shows how you can win the trust and in this case the admiration of the world by being inclusive with products that aren't necessarily targeted at your standard uh, consumer, mm. your mainstream consumer. Might be time for a quick question. Oh yeah. What do you sure. think? Sure. Um, so Logan was asking, when do you when do you think brands should or shouldn't comment or participate on social and political issues? That's a hot potato. Oh yeah, it is, and it's a real um, case by case basis, isn't it? Um, because sometimes, as a brand, it, you can look quite cynical if you mm. are seen to be doing it to jump on a bandwagon. Right. Yes, um, you don't want to. Yeah, be seen to be profiting from somebody else's misfortune if it's a topical event or something like that. I think it, it has to, you have to be really judicious if you're going to do it and you have to kind of take a calculated risk. Um, in Nike's case that, I mean, there was those people who were very for and those people who were very against um, not standing during the, um, the national anthem. So you knew it could go one of either mm. of two ways. But yeah, you do. I think you have to be pretty careful um, yeah, yeah, that's a that is a tricky one. Yeah, um, you just have to use common sense, I think. Yeah, and I think you know you're mentioning authenticity so much. Like mm. it would need to come from a very a very authentic mm-hmm. place, and um, you know trying to understand your culture and really yeah, understanding absolutely. your yeah. your users or your yeah. or your you know the people who support you, followers, yeah. all that sort of thing. It's probably quite quite a web, like quite connected. Yeah, um, and a constant feedback loop. And obviously yeah. that's going to differ from place to place mm. um, as well. So yeah, yeah, it's a it's a tough one, but mm. it can be done. I'm sure there are like I'm just trying to think off the top of my head of like examples of when it's been done badly. Mm. I'll have to come back to that. One. Well, that's good because we're going to invite you back a little bit later oh, for yeah. our roundtable. So that's I've perfect. We might pick, pick that one up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I love this campaign 
from IKEA in Israel. Um, one in 10 people in Israel are disabled. Um, and they've really solved a problem because this, this guy on the screen here has cerebral palsy. Um, and at home, he, he was sort of talking about how he's, he has to use medicalized furniture. And that, that stuff is really quite expensive, that mm. custom made um, medical equipment for him to just be able to, you know, maneuver him, himself around the house and do things. Um, yeah, and, and just from a visual point of view, it's, it's not very attractive, um, the, the furniture. And he, it, it, it leaves many disabled people feeling very uncomfortable in their mm. own homes. Um, for example, like even just the, the act of sitting down on a sofa like this, it's very hard for people with cerebral palsy to be able to stand up again. Um, right. Yeah, so that's something about a standard piece of furniture that, that can be changed. Um, similarly, you need your fine motor skills to do basic basic tasks like opening a, especially if the target, just like on a, a digital interface is small, that small handle there, it's very hard for people to op right. open it unless you've got mm -hmm. um, really good um, motor skills. Um, and similarly, this lamp, turning on a lamp um, is very difficult. But thanks to this fantastic initiative, and I love the fact that this is um, a play on disable, as well, mm. but instead it's Disables, that's perfect. So good, That's huh? great. I haven't uh, seen this. Yeah, so, oh, it's amazing. Mm. Um, yeah, suddenly IKEA's best-selling products can be used by anyone. And the way they did this was pretty much as you do any classic design project, mm. include the stakeholders, like mm -hmm. rule number one. Uh, so many design products go wrong because the intended uh, recipients or users at the end just aren't included in the process. For some mm. reason, they're not consulted. So you don't get those insights needed to make that real change. Um, but still make disabled people, why aren't they part of um, design teams permanently so that you would never ever put out an exclusionary product or service again because you have somebody on your team that can tell you when you're getting it wrong. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Much more inclusi inclusivity needed in design. Um, so that sort of resulted in these little add-ons for their products, you know, to make things much easier. There's a huge button that sits over the little button to help it be switched on and off more easily. The simple addition of a bit of a lift at the back of the couch allows um, the, the man we saw before with cerebral palsy to, to, to get himself off it without, right. you know, just, just tiny little things. Mm. Um, but the beauty of all of this, the genius of, uh, is that all of these little add-ons are available to print uh, three-dimensionally um, for free so the software is out there and people can just print these things mm. and uh, add them to their furniture so they get the the sort of nice um, the aesthetic of the of the IKEA furniture without having to you know buy anything expensive and the case film ends with a very cute little quip, quip from him saying they should make self-assembling furniture which I think is really sweet <laughs> <laughs> if you watch that case film you'll see it Right. So yeah, so they go. They really put the power back in the hands of, of disabled people with this uh, campaign, which is yeah. fantastic. Um, um, time for another question. Sure. What do you think? Um, so Jamal was asking. We'd love to know your thoughts on the rebranding of Yahoo and their approach to redoing everything about their brand. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that kept uh, him or her away from Yahoo was security issues they faced. I'm going to have to come clean and say I have not seen the rebranding of Yahoo. How recent is that? I don't mm. know if that person can... I remember it being a while ago. Maybe you yeah. can elaborate a little bit on, on what, yeah, what they did question. What they did do. I know that yeah. they bought Tumblr yeah. and then shut down all the pornography on Tumblr yeah. and then everybody left Tumblr. Yeah. I know that that happened. Yeah. Um, well, the second part of that question I can see is that you know the security issues being, yeah. being one of the reasons why they stayed away from that platform. You know, I think is, you know, as we were just talking about with Facebook before, I mean, that seems to be ubiquitous uh, across a lot of platforms. People are very concerned about how their data is being used. Mm. Um, and I've got some content about that in a minute. Okay, cool. Um, yes. Um, oh, it was today. Oh, today. oh, we've been here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll I to, was up really late. So. We'll, ha we'll have to check. <laughs> we'll have to maybe check it out. Um, I guess this is what happens when you do, like, a you know, couple of hours live stream in the morning. Mm -hmm. You do miss the news. Mm, you do. Um, maybe the US team will pick up on this. Yeah, actually, that's a really good, yeah. So, oh, Pentagram, of course. Oh, Pentagram yeah. did it. Oh, cool. Hey, yeah. you know, we learn from you guys too. This is great. Yeah. We'll check that out. Maybe we can. Um, have a look and do a little yep. analysis. Is that my homework between now and yep, then? Yeah, that's oh, our homework. Great. That's okay. okay. We'll, yep. have, we'll have a bite to eat as well. Yeah, fine. Um, but yeah, I think 
that IKEA campaign, you see a corporation behaving as a human. Yeah. And I think that's that should be encouraged um, because, you know, obviously human behaviour are probably a lot more trustworthy behaviour than mm. uh, than corporate behaviour. Um, and speaking of behaving like a human, right. I mean, what do these images have in common? Mm. Is that is that a rhetorical question? No, it's a question for you, Flynn. Okay, yeah. I think this, <laughs> this might have something to do with the Me Too movement. Yes. They all have this in common, and you're huh. absolutely right. Um, they're all uh, causes driven by people power and uh, facilitated by connective technology. And people are really realising now that you can actually do a lot without mm. the backing of big business, and sometimes it's, in fact, big business that is the problem. Mm. Um, so it's, 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 more, it's less... A um, few people doing a little bit, and, a, and it's more a lot of people doing um, a bit more than they currently do. Yeah. Um, and these hashtags really uh, sort of indicate people have realised they have the power to act at scale and turn those beliefs into action. Um, you know, seriously, what we've just seen over the last mm. few days, a 16-year-old autistic girl has just facilitated the biggest community engagement process the world has ever seen. Mm. And I, I mean, this to me is just amazing. Um, you know, and, and really good on Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Amazing. She uh, she just gave them a well des um, deserved spray too this morning after she she got across to the UN convention by boat. By boat. Yeah. Isn't which some amazing? people had the audacity to criticise, which yeah. I can believe. But she really, in she demonstrated that integrity by, you know, not taking a plane or however else she could have got there. Mm. Um, and that really shows, you know, her trustworthy nature. Like she really stayed true to those ideals. Mm. Um, yeah, so people may be more trustworthy than companies, but are they more trustworthy than machines? And this is where we start mm. to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, um, got another question. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, we're, so Prue's coming back at four and we're going to have a bit of a discussion about the things that came up so we're gonna we're gonna check out that yahoo stuff so mm -hmm. i promise so if you if you come back or you stick around for that long um we will look into that and mm -hmm. i'm really excited about that um so a question from joe was like to hear your view on co cultural appropriation if it can be good when is it not okay oh, yeah it's really good you're really getting the, you're good. getting the really the really pointy questions i love it yeah um cultural appropriation it's a big no no mm. um I just have those flashbacks in my head of Lana, uh, Lana Del Rey wearing the African, um, uh, sorry, not African, the Indian, Indian headdress. Indian and American yeah. headdress. Yeah, like yeah sorry, Native American headdress, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, if it Especially for brands, good, I suppose. Oh, it's a big no no for yeah. brands. You'll get called out on that so fast. Yeah. Um, no, I can't think of an instance where it's good. Perhaps the questioner can provide an example. Mm. Um, cool. We might yeah. do that. We might use that for our roundtable as well. That's a yeah. really pointy one. Yeah. Might require some questions. unpacking. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but great, great questions. I yeah. mean, this is the sort of thing that I think we all need to, we all see as, as people, mm -hmm. like on Twitter or wherever you are, TikTok, you yeah. know, whatever you're, whatever you're doing, see other brands do it and we have our mm -hmm. own personal opinion. And then obviously we're working and creating content mm -hmm. for clients who are brands mm -hmm. as well. So we need to yeah. be really um really have our finger on the pulse with this sort of stuff and yeah. continue to continue to talk with each other about it yeah and try to figure it out absolutely and i think kind of if you stray into the like onto the wrong side and maybe you do something that that, that gets a backlash you have to be willing to stand up and own it as well mm. um and yeah just don't let it slide because that's how you gain back trust is admitting your mistakes that you are are not human Right. So it might be a brand, but um, like all good humans, you would apologise if you hurt somebody. Yeah. Brands need to do the same thing. Mm. Um, oh, yes. Okay, so AI technology now able to, um, like a human, understand, reason, learn and interact. Um, and a really clear message in Khan this year that we is was that we shouldn't fear AI but rather embrace it. Um, and, and, yeah, I think it, it's really in our nature when... When we have a great leap in technology like this, for uh, moral panic to ensue, because right. Socrates himself um, feared that books would compromise children's memories. Right. Yeah. Um, yet we've got ourselves through the TV, internet, and the smartphone, um, 
And ironically, it's through AI that Socrates' command to know thyself will be enabled by this technology. Mm. And I think we've all seen the examples of, you know, applications of this in, in radiology. It really does help us to understand ourselves better and it can enhance every industry, the creative industries included. Um, I, you know, your Sensei product, Adobe Sensei product, mm -hmm. are amazing. Um, but yeah, AI's got sharper eyes than any radiologist. This image here actually shows Alzheimer's being predicted in a patient years before that any symptoms showed up. And on the right there, that picture, that is that is a product that was uh, created to help child oncology patients. It's called My Alflac Duck. Um, and it's a really sweet little thing. It's a little companion. It can mirror patients' moods and emulate the same painful therapies that the children have to endure. So it really gets that empathy going. Yeah. Um, it can dance, quack, nuzzle, sources a, uh, serve as a source of comfort to patients when they're going through such a hard time. Um, so AI can really offer us a future of powerful possibilities. And I'm really excited for what it means for the creative industries. Mm, absolutely. Can't wait yeah. to see some of those developments. Um, and of course, you know, AI relies on, on people's data and we're straying back into big tech territory here. But, um, you know, Cambridge Analytica touched on that as an example of data usage gone wrong. But data is extremely powerful and with it, our lives can be easier. Can provide recommendations on things you actually want, uh, reduce the amount of time you spend on arduous tasks and allow you to make better informed decisions. But, you know, what cost is this really coming at? and raises the question, should customers or consumers really be compensated for mm. that, that data? And what does good and trustworthy data usage look like? Um, one of our trends this year sort of outlined the idea that if you actually were to hand over your data to somebody else, when we think about it as being really valuable, it's really only valuable in aggregate. Your own personal data is worth about 10 bucks. That's about as much That's as it. You. That's it. That's, That's all. It. It's, only, um, it's only valuable when it's, as I said, in aggregate. So that's disappointing. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that's my retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one, okay, so super AI is a, is a great example of data done right. Um, health data in particular, people are really funny about giving away. Uh, you might have remember there was a bit of a furor around the My Health record um, mm, thing, yep. thing that happened this year. Mm -hmm. um, and that is literally a project devoted to improving the health of people in this country. Um, but this app gamifies health data collection and it's aimed at Gen Z, otherwise known as teenagers. It turns the body into a game controller and captures biometric data on activity and diet via wearable sensors. It scrubs that data and then shares it anon anonymously uh, for use by AI for disease research um, into a super data cloud. Mm. Um, and then gives the user valuable coupons back in exchange for that information, which is, you know, because it's being done anonymously for the good of all, is a really great use of data. And it looks like it'd be fun as well. It does look I mean, pretty it's, fun. It's been designed specifically for that audience, and I think that's pretty clear. Um, there's a, uh, an interview with the founder, Sabine Seymour, um, on Vimeo, um, about how she believes data should be used for good, obviously. Um, so that's an interesting one to watch. Um, similarly, we've got an app called Floodlights for a different audience, but it's aimed at, um, it uses smartphone sensors and functionality to pick up subtle phys physical progressions in multiple sclerosis in its users. So um, things like shaking hands and walking pace can be picked up and then shared anonymously um, for open access research designed to manage that condition better and one day hopefully find mm. a QR. So, I mean, that's a really, really great use of data as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was health, but there are other applications, obviously, in retail. Um, and one of the businesses doing data right is called Stitch Fix. And that's, this is an online um, personal styling service in the US, which shares uh, size, lifestyle, and motivational data with manufacturers to, to create better clothes for its customer customers, but without the transactional data risk. Um, and the funny thing, and any woman will know this, like you can be about one of 10 sizes, um, but this using artificial intelligence and based on what garments get, re get returned actually figures out your true size so that then you can be offered clothing, um, you know, that actually fits you. And in that, that loop, that transactional loop sends that data back to clothing manufacturers so it makes clothes fit better for everyone, which is, mm. you know, a thing. Um, 
yeah so that that's sort of making that experience of buying and clothing wearing clothes um you know better for everyone uh, another use of data which is amazing comes from volvo this was another gold winner at Cannes this year and this campaign um is really around championing the building building of safer cars using data and the yeah. art direction on this little case film is absolutely stunning um little james blake track in the background you should check it out um maybe we'll put a link up to that later mm. but um yeah it, what it does is it sort of replicates the impacts of car crashes on these sort of people made up of little data points um in a really simple way and way and it shows the impact of car crashes and it's really graphic even though it's animation you should check it out it's quite amazing um but by encouraging others in the car industry to use the data that Volvo has co collected, they're building safer cars for everybody, and that is an amazing use of data. Mm. Um, and you would kind of expect with a brand obsessed with driver safety, they're going to be really um, great with your data as well and look after that. Um, and the whole reason they're doing this is, of course, um, the majority of car uh, crash test dummies are actually male. So this oh, so the actual are. dummies that they create. Correct. Wow. So that's why you see like appalling um, outcomes in car crashes for women because mm. the crash test dummies are male. Um, and we've seen a lot of this in the medical industry lately. Uh, the cures and treatments have been devised. You know, the male is kind of like the default. And um, I have heard about yeah. that, about a lot of the testing has been found, a lot of the basis of a lot of the information that we have now, because a lot of the testing was done mm -hmm. just, just on men and not on women. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're built quite differently. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, truly a man's world. Yeah, um, wow. Yeah. Mm. So Volvo is really trying to change this, um, mm. which is fantastic. And hopefully everybody in the auto industry accesses that data and can make their cars safe. Um, uh, yeah. That's the 40 years, yes, they've collected that. Um, but now let's talk reality. Got a question. Um, yes. How um, someone was talking about, Gemma was asking about, can we talk about Tesla's AI? And I think that's quite interesting, like AI within self-driving cars and, and things like that. What, Tesla's um, uh, artificial, AI's, artificial intelligence. intelligence? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the whole, that, the whole product is based on, on that, um, mm. I think. Um, yeah, they're, they're basically just moving uh, data generators. Mm. Um, and obviously that's how they work, based on, on AI. I'm not, I'm not sure what specifically they want to ask about I it. think it's quite interesting about um, the self-driving cars um, thing in, in that a lot of people, I think, confuse or, or don't know the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm. And, like, this idea of AI is basically Terminator, like kind of level thing, whereas machine learning is, you know, self-driving cars actually tara talked about this once mm -hmm. with us um is machine learning because mm -hmm. it, it just drives the car yeah that's but it's right. not gonna it's not gonna make your coffee for you yeah. whereas like this idea of a, a fully functional ai is yeah. going to work as uh, almost mimic our yeah. behavior within that yeah. kind of that kind of situation yeah. but how do you feel about like yeah tesla's ai and self-driving cars you're quite positive about ai and where that's going yeah i am um i think well i mean some of the applications we just looked at mm. um I think, uh, um, you know, obviously have enormous benefits to humanity. Self-driving mm. cars um, will, if, you know, if everything works out the way it's meant to, mm. they'll be a lot safer than um, conventional cars. Mm. And they will also, um, you know, you think about um, a train of uh, self-driving vehicles together mm. um, and they can predict each other's speed and everything. It also, um, you know, streamlines the movement of traffic on our roads and things like mm. that so there's not as much stop start because every, it's all working in concert together so i i think that yeah and and also and another one of um fjord's trends a couple of years ago um we talked about the idea of it, it completely changing what the experience of driving in a car actually could be if right. you're not actually sitting there concentrating on driving your vehicle what might you do in that vehicle um otherwise more you know, work please no um <laughs> you know maybe you could use it it could be a um educational opportunity or mm. a social opportunity or you could have a sleep <laughs> ads <laughs> yeah no not ads <laughs> um so yeah i think there's a there's a whole lot i mean the 
AI is going to disrupt what we the way we think about mm. things, and you know, car travel is just one of them. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and speaking of those fraud trends, I'm trying to like create all these segues. Here. Yeah, these segues are great. Yeah, um, synthetic <laughs> realities. Um, and this is a really interesting one. When we talk about this, or when we have talked about this one this year, um, it's really just blown people's minds. Um, there's a huge potential for this tech uh, and deep fakes are a huge, uh, a huge danger from, I'd say mostly from a political perspective. But that also, like, it's so funny. Whenever new technology gets introduced, it tends to show up um, in its application to pornography. Uh, and right. unfortunately for women, there have been many instances of, um, you know, uh, celebrities being deep faked onto right. porn stars, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so, it, yeah, there's there's so much risk out there with this, this sort of tech. Um, and that really needs to be, I mean, there is somebody out there at the moment, or there's quite a few companies uh, coming up with like a deep fake, um, you know, um, test. And mm. uh, so far it's pretty proved to be about 90% accurate, but you know, it's gonna be, well, it's like if you look at some of these examples, mm. uh, you know, we've got Lil Michaela here, who is actually 100% deep faked. She is a fake persona. I follow her on Instagram. She's a, an entertainer slash singer. Um, and it's really funny if you read oh, some wow. of the comments on her Instagram feed, like people are convinced that she is real. Right. Um, she's got she got 1.6 million followers. She does actually perform on stage as a hologram. So that's kind of cool. Um, but you know, when stuff happens on her Instagram feed, people really respond with admiration and wonder and empathy. And you get that total anthropomorphization of mm. technology. I mean, she's literally pixels on a screen. Um, yeah, but you know, Given all of the stats and all the things I just talked about, can we kind of say that she's real? I don't know what's real anymore. Oh, uh, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. That yeah. opens that whole, that it whole does. door. It certainly does. When we first started talking about this trend, this was one of the examples we used um, to kind of illustrate it. Uh, it literally a horse turning into a zebra. Mm. Um, and you can see immediately how deep fakes may pose a problem, like saying one thing is one thing when actually it's another. Mm. Um, yeah, Adobe Cloak, that tool uh, for removing uh, objects from video in a really seamless way. You can see mm. that before and after there. We have some tutorials on how to do that on Behance, actually. Mm -hmm. So just check that there out. You go. Yeah, very quick. Uh, you can do it with video now very quickly as well. Can you? Yep. Yeah, right. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. not a motion designer. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it'd probably be preferable in tweaking each individual frame, which I know you have to do um, traditionally. Um, oh, but no, we can do it all. We can just do it all with machine learning now. Unbelievable. Mm. Shadows yeah. and everything. Yeah, it's I think that's that's very impressive, but um, yeah, I think uh, it's it's sort of almost it's happened with sound too. In this, I'm just going to play you a little snippet here um, of um, something that we did. Uh, Accenture Interactive did that, which won a gold line at last year's Khan Awards with um, the JFK Unsilence piece, which basically allowed him after 55 years to deliver the trademarks. Uh, trademark speech that he was on his way to deliver when he was unfortunately gunned down um, by Lee Harvey Oswald. So um, this this was a world first. Um, his that speech was recreated in his own voice, and this is this is what it sounds like. In a world of conflict and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason. That's pretty incredible. I mean, to, to actually literally bring somebody back to life with mm. their voice. And then, I mean, now we've got Google Duplex sort of doing the same thing, making phone calls on people's behalf and yep. all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, people, people lost their minds when <laughs> that happened. Um, unfortunately, it's being uh, given human nature. AI is now being used to commit crimes. These kinds of voice things are happening. A UK energy company chief, chief executive was tricked into wiring two hundred thousand euro to wow. a Hungarian supplier because he believed his boss was instructing him to do so over the phone. Wow. So that is this, this is an area that really needs regulation. But mm. What's happening with deepfakes visually is is pretty crazy. Um, this is Bill Hader. He's an American actor, comedian, writer, producer, and director. I love Bill Hader. Um, he's he's so good. He's actually really good at um, 
impressions, impressions as well. Yeah. And there's a there's a YouTube user called Control Shift Face who you mm. should have a look at. It does some really great work using Paperspace, which is a computing cloud platform, and he brings those impressions to life. Mm. And there's one that he did he, d he did with on Letterman, um, and he starts sort of recounting a story about working with Tom Cruise. Um, and as he recounts what Tom Cruise is saying, he literally turns into Tom Cruise. You've got to see the actual video of this. It's incredible. It's wild. We can't play yeah. it here, but you guys will have yeah. to check it out. Yeah. And then he starts talking uh, talking about Seth Rogers and he sort of turns into him as well. Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen, yeah. sorry. Uh, before turning into Tom Cruise again, <laughs> which is uh, pretty incredible, but you need to check that out. Terrifying. So, yeah. And so, I mean, look, this is an application of this stuff just for fun. And that that is a much younger Tom Cruise, I think. True. <laughs> Yeah. I think Tom Cruise would like a deep face on top of Tom Cruise <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, yeah, it's sort of just for fun, but there are now ca companies out there. There's one called Canny AI. It's a, it's a new platform that's offering these services to business. So you can replace the dialogue in any footage or lip sync um, your content, in dubbed, co dubbed content in any language, mm. upload your video, choose the language, receive a truly localized video for your audience. And the potential to, for this tech to be used for evil is huge. But the cost savings for businesses are also equally huge because you just, you know, when you you can just repurpose content instead of shooting new stuff. Cool. Um, there's a great self-promotional piece on their website that you should see as well. Um, and it's all, it's basically the world leaders lip, uh, singing John Lennon's Imagine and um, that it's it's just so beautifully done. Um, that's my favourite Justin Trudeau, although the blackface thing. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so they're there. I mean, like, and you can see with this technology how, um, you know, what the possibilities are. Mm. Um, and it's getting better and better. And we were talking before about, you know, um, how it actually works. Um, gener generative adversarial networks usually take in, a, they're trained by looking at a whole lot of images of people, of a person, mm. um, and then sort of working that in using um, the software. However, this is a, an app uh, in China that, can do it with just one photo. And you, you can see here um, that being applied to a famous scene. Um, yeah, and the, but there, there is a political threat here. There are implications because you think about Hong Kong and what's happening there now and protesters covering their faces um, because there is real danger of, yeah. of their images being used in this context mm -hmm. to, um, you know, convict people. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of... Sometimes, uh, whenever a service like this is provided for free, a company is inevitably profiting from your data. Right. Uh, sometimes it's for better ad targeting. Sometimes it's to train their AI to be smarter, for better at facial recognition. But often you don't know. Um, it's something to be wary of, and I'd definitely be staying off FaceApp. <laughs> um, quickly, uh, this, this is where things take a little bit of a turn for the right. strange. That's good because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Oh God, I'm, okay, minutes. I'm going to have to really uh, zip through this. Mm. So um, where does this l it leave us in this world? Like, are, you, are we at a point where we can't really even trust ourselves? Mm. Um, uh, possibly because as it turns out, our memories are, you know, really fallible. And I'm not, I'm not talking about forgetting where you put your keys. I'm talking a bit, I'm talking about misrem mis mis remembering. Thank you. Things on a mass scale. And there's this fascinating theory called the Mandela effect. Right. And it's called the Mandela effect because apparently some people remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison. Right. right? And that is a widely held belief. Mm. And actually anybody who knows the truth knows that he, mm. he died at the ripe old age of 93, not in prison. Mm. But did you see the James Bond film? This is Jaws. Yeah, this is Jaws. It came out in 1979. And this guy, Richard Keel, is seven foot one uh, with a mouthful of metal. And there's a famous scene where he's sort of, something explodes and he's trapped under this, this thing and en so enters this tiny little woman who helps him get out of trouble and rescues him. And he smiles at her and his teeth glint in the sun. And she looks up at this huge man and there's this moment of she's going to get really scared and run away. Mm. Um, and she smiles back, uh, revealing that she's wearing braces that similarly glint in the sun. Mm. There's a funny moment of recognition. They fall in love, leave the scene together. At least that's how I remember the scene. Mm. And that's how millions of other people around the world remember the scene too. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, when she smiles, there are no braces. Oh. Um, and the really funny thing about this is that scene no longer makes sense. 
Um, right. Yeah, and I heard this and I was just like, yeah, I was convinced she was wearing braces. Yeah. Um, the, the, where this gets tricky is like if we do enter this era of brain computer interfaces, because mm. um, things, this, this phenomenon is probably going to have serious repercussions because whose version of history is right? This is a, you know, very minor, course of history is not going to change via somebody wearing braces or not. Mm. But what will that concept of reality be in the future? Like, and how will the future potentially be edited? I love it. We're going to have to yeah. end on that sure. on that thought. That is fine. Um, it's been fantastic. I love talking about this. We're going to pick up some of those questions, yeah, like I said before, um, that came through because I think it's going to take a lot to unpack. Uh-huh. I think it would be better as a big discussion. Um, I want to check out the Yahoo stuff because that's happened while we've been live. Yeah, totally. Um, stick around. Um, so uh, we're going to be de- designing in Adobe XD with uh, Jamie Reagan and Jason Grant from Adobe. Um, so they're going to take you through some some stuff for the next hour and a half and then we'll be back at four o'clock to chat about that stuff um, we also have jay from google coming in this afternoon so heaps of great content to kind of finish out the sydney leg um thank you so much Prue, for joining us no problem, it's been fantastic <laughs> and uh we'll see you soon